to David Larrabee's talk. Good afternoon. In Matthew 25, we are called to feed the hungry, visit the sick and imprisoned, give water to the thirsty, clothe the naked, and welcome the stranger. The assumption is that some people have the means to help others and are therefore ethically required to do so. My reading of this passage is that these are examples of required actions, not an exhaustive list. A generalization is that other people's needs are to be prioritized over our desires. Of course, the trick is to separate needs from desires. So today, I want to ask the question, are the developed countries using more fossil fuels than they need at the expense of the least developed countries' needs? My answer is yes. First, I'll outline what is required to limit the global average temperature rise to 2 degrees Celsius. Next, I will explore the concept of an energy poverty line. Since fossil fuels account for about 80% of primary energy production, energy poverty and inequality in emissions are linked together. This suggests examining the inequality in carbon emissions. A strategy that both limits temperature rise to 2 degrees C and reduces emissions inequality will be presented. Unfortunately, the requirements on the U.S. are severe enough that it is unlikely to be followed. It is possible to formulate an energy greed line. The United States is well above that line. Then we'll go on to the question and answers. So on to the details. There is a direct relationship between the cumulative greenhouse gas emissions and the expe expected peak temperature rise. To keep that rise below 2 degrees C means that the cumulative anthropogenic carbon emissions since 1750 must stay below 1 trillion metric tons of carbon. This plot shows the history of global carbon dioxide emissions measured in tons of carbon, not CO2, carbon, and some possible future scenarios. The green and red lines limit the greenhouse gas emissions to levels representing 2 and 3 degrees C temperature rise. I've chosen profiles that match the current slope and then exponentially decay to zero. As we proceed along these paths, the easy reductions will come first, and further reductions will become increasingly difficult. The two degree C curve is a significant challenge. Nonetheless, I will use that scenario in the discussions that follow. Rather than look at the situation from the point of view of the developed world, I want to look through the lens of countries that are struggling to meet the needs of their populace. A poverty line represents a financial income below which it is extremely difficult to satisfy basic human needs, shelter, food, medical care, etc. The same idea can be applied to our energy consumption. What is the energy consumption poverty line? What is needed is a metric that quantifies the ability of a country to, make, to meet the basic human needs of its population. One such measure is the Human Development Index maintained by the United Nations. It includes measures of life expectancy, schooling, and gross national income per capita. The index ranges from zero to one. In 2020, the index was calculated for 189 countries and varied from 0 0.957 in Norway to 0 0.394 in Niger. There is a rough relationship between the country's human development index and the per capita total annual energy consumption, shown here. I calculated an annual million watt hour equivalent energy consumption per capita, assuming a conversion factor of 40% between fossil fuel consumption and equivalent electrical energy. Plotting the consumption on the horizontal axis versus the human development index on the vertical axis, we arrive at the following graph. A trend is clearly visible. Low human development index countries benefit a lot from an increase in annual per capita energy consumption. I'll return to the higher development index countries later. The 33 countries with an index below 0 0.55 are considered to have low levels of human development. Here is a plot of the human development index of the 53 countries with the lowest annual per capita energy consumption versus that consumption. Of the 25 countries with less than 0 0.6 annual million watt equivalent hours per capita, only Comoros squeaks above the low human development line right there. Countries between 0 0.6 and 1.5 have a 50% chance of making it into the medium human development category. Above 1.5, all countries are at least in the medium human development and mixed categories. This gives evidence of an energy poverty line somewhere between 0 0.6 
than 1.5 annual million watt hour equivalents per capita. Without the energy to at least rise into the medium human development category, it is unlikely that these countries will meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Fossil fuels will play a role in meeting the energy needs of these countries below the energy poverty line. Global electric energy consumption continues to rise, as does the electricity generated by renewable energy. The International Energy Agency projects that in 2021, renewable electrical energy growth will cover just over 50% of the growth of electrical energy consumption. We are still dependent on fossil fuels, even for our growth. It is reasonable to expect that the low human development index countries will increase their use of fossil fuels in the short run before they transition to a renewable energy economy. The ability of the atmosphere to absorb a limited amount of CO2 is a resource that can be expended for meeting human needs as well as being used to satisfy excessive desires. Is this resource being shared equally? One way of assessing inequality is the Lorenz curve. Here we sort the countries by their emissions per capita from lowest to highest. For each country in the list, we compute a cumulative population, the total population of that country, plus the population of all the countries with a lower per capita emission. The cumulative population is plotted on the horizontal axis. We compute the cumulative emission, the total emission of a country, plus the emissions of all the countries with a lower per capita emission. The cumulative emission is plotted on the vertical axis. At the present time, year 2020, we get the following curve, this curve. If the emissions were equally shared, the curve would be a straight line, shown in the plot. The area between the straight line and the actual curve represents the inequality. We can express this as a percentage of the total area under the straight line. This number is called a Gini coefficient. A Gini coefficient of zero represents total equality. A Gini coefficient of one represents maximal inequality. Currently, the coefficient is 0 0.485. To put this in perspective, the Gini coefficient for household income in the United States is about the same value. The red circles in the, are the low human development index countries, all in the lower part of the curve, those with the least emissions per capita. So the resource that carbon emissions represent is not being shared equally. Those most in need have the smallest emissions per capita. There are several strategies suggested for the reduction of CO2 emissions. Carbon taxes, carbon caps, perhaps with trading, voluntary reductions, carbon capture and storage, just to name a few. How would these strategies affect those most in need? What we need is insight into what might happen with the various options. To that end, I've created a simplified model for projections, which we can use to see how various carbon emission strategies will play out. The purpose here is insight, not to generate hard numerical predictions. I consider the business as usual projection as a starting point. Countries are, are assumed to continue the trends they have already started. If there is a rising trend in emissions per capita, it is continued linearly. If there is a declining trend, it is assumed to follow an exponential decay. The exceptions are land use changes and international shipping emissions. These are assumed to rise with the current slope, flatten, and then fall to zero linearly by 2069. Population projections use the United Nations medium variant. Here I will consider two different strategies, grandfathering and capping the emissions per capita. I will assume that these strategies are strictly implemented in such a way as to follow the two degree C curve I showed earlier. Grandfathering requires all countries to reduce their total emissions by a common fixed percentage of each country's base year. Emissions per capita cap sets a maximum limit of the emissions per capita for all countries. Countries that are below this limit are assumed to follow the business as usual curve. In both cases, the limits are adjusted on a yearly basis. This plot shows the history of the Gini coefficient for these cases. Note that the Gini coefficient has been falling, a good thing. But under the model's business as usual curve, it would flatten and then start to rise. Under a grandfathering scheme, the inequality grows even faster than the business as usual case. The reason is the total country's emissions are limited under grandfathering. These emissions have to be divided among the population. The higher the population growth, 
the faster the emissions per capita have to fall. Low emission country, per capita countries tend to have a higher population growth. So this drives the Gini coefficient higher. Capping the emissions per capita lowers the Gini coefficient since the high emitting countries are restricted earlier than the lower emission countries. What strategies are employed have major effects on global emissions inequalities? So we should ask the question, what are these effects? What does this effect have on the United States? This is a plot of the historical carbon emissions per capita for the United States, as well as the three sets of projections. The blue line is the business as usual case for the United States. The red dotted line represents would be required on the grandfathering scheme outlined earlier. The green line represents the situation under an emissions per capita cap strategy. Let these curves sink in for a moment. Business as usual will result in a temperature rise above 2 degrees C. Grandfathering requires the U.S. to consume at a significantly lower rate. The emissions per capita cap is even more challenging. If COVID-19 has taught us anything, it is how resistant people are to a lifestyle change. Both the red and the green curves would require major lifestyle changes due to the rapid descent of the curves. Both grandfathering and emission per capita cap seem unlikely to be acceptable politically or economically. But before continuing, let's consider the effect on countries with low human development index. I'm going to use Ethiopia as an example. Ethiopia's emissions have been increasing, as the blue business as usual line shows. However, the vertical axis is very different. Currently, the U.S. is about four tons of carbon per person per year, while Ethiopia is about one one hundredth of that value. Using an emissions per capita cap as a strategy doesn't put limits on Ethiopia until about 2068, while the grandfathering strategy clause puts restrictions on Ethiopia almost immediately. Ethiopia has more room under the emissions per capita cap strategy than under the grandfathering scheme. Emissions per capita cap favors the low human development countries. It gives more emissions headroom to allow the countries to improve their human development index. So does the United States need to consume as much energy as it does? Or is our energy consumption driven by our lust for more and more and more? Recently, the concept of a greed line has been proposed. So is there an equivalent energy greed line? Let me return to the plot of the Human Development Index versus annual energy consumption per capita plot I started with. I have drawn a greed line at 25 annual million watt hour equivalents per capita. Above that value, there seems to be a little improvement in the Human Development Index as energy increases. It would seem that above the greed line, needs can be met, but there are always more desires. Germany and Switzerland are examples of country, countries with comparable human development index, but whose energy consumption is below the greed line. If our consumption had no consequence on others, it might be gluttony, but not greed. But our consumption is occurring at a cost to those whose needs are not being met. The causal link is the limitations of the atmosphere to safely contain our carbon emissions. David, we do. You have about two minutes left. Thank you. Reducing the U.S. energy consumption to the green line would reduce consumption by 42% in the U.S. This would free up carbon space for those who need it most. Summary. The amount of greenhouse gases we emit can emit is limited. There is major inequality in emissions with those below the energy poverty line having the least. It is possible, but perhaps unlikely that this will change. The U.S. is above an energy greed line that could meet that and could meet the needs of its people, but certainly not all the desires, while reducing our energy consumption significantly. If we lowered our energy consumption, we would at least provide room for the countries in the low human development category to improve. Refusing to do so is greed. The Matthew 25 parable, the sheep and the goats would seem to indicate that in regards to greenhouse gas emissions, the U.S. belongs to the category of a goat. The U.S. economy is based on trying to satisfy insatiable desires, as if we could purchase our way to happiness and salvation. Jesus calls us to put God first and our neighbor's needs ahead of our excess. In this case, a call for voluntary simplicity.
which churches are willing to embrace such a calling? Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to entertain questions at this time. Thank you, David. Arnold, you had a question? Uh, thanks for your interesting presentation, uh, David. Great uh, plots and graphs, and I learned about uh, the Gini coefficient and so forth. <laughs> um, I, one of those plots as a Canadian made me really embarrassed because we are even worse than the Americans. Uh, and, you know, you I, I guess I take some responsibility <laughs> for that myself, but I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the reasons for uh, some of these. I'm thinking about the one where the where Canada was on a greed plot even further um, yeah. beyond the U.S. Um, I'm thinking that in Canada, our consumption is high because we have a relatively low population density and we're really quite spread out. And so we have large transportation costs um, and it's colder in the winter. Uh, and, um, and I think the tar sands and our oil industry is probably contributing. Um, are there are there good reasons why countries should be high on this and other ones like low, like like just, just having a low population density? Does that sort of automatically make it more necessary to expend? I mean, it's an excellent question. And I've, I've gone and searched for all kinds of other correlations. Um, certainly the parts of Canada have um, cold weather. And, but I'm not so sure that I've heard the urban versus rural question before. I'm not sure that holds a lot of weight. It's often used in the U.S. as we're a big country. Um, that assumes that, that we need to, that all of us need to travel from coast to coast. We don't need to. Um, so I think as part of it historical, we are, we are, we're both countries that want to, um, we put a lot of faith in buying things. You know, we, um, I'll also add that the other, the other, there might be one other difference that, that's very hard to quantify. All of these plots, and we talk about CO2, are based on who uses it. So when I import something from China, the CO2 emissions in the manufacturer are bed to China. So if Canada is more self-sufficient in its manufacturing, that would not, than the U.S., that would also naturally drive it up. So I don't have a great answer for you. <laughs> okay, we have another question in the chat. It's from John DeMassa. I hope he doesn't mind me reading it. Uh, it's, uh, if one compares CO2 emissions during the years 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021, how do they compare? I ask because in 2020, global lockdown included lowered production. Was there a parallel reduction in the CO2 levels? That's a great question. Um, so the short answer, 2021 is in process, so we, we really won't know the final result for 2021 for a while. 2020, the actual ca carbon for the countries isn't fully available yet. The people that do that are called the Carbon Project. And so the earliest, latest day we have on a country national wide basis is 2019. The IAEI has, the International Energy Agency has estimated that overall, that the energy um, consumption went down globally by a little bit in the single digit percents. Locally, during a shutdown, it went down by quite a bit more. So there were, there were places, for instance, I live in Jersey City, right across from New York, where locally the consumption could drop by 20 or 30% while it's under shutdown. Um, the other at thing was that the, sh the energy shift, there were shifts in made versus gasoline versus other things. Um, but it looks like that's going to correct it. Unfortunately, come back to normal. <laughs> so there are effects that we observe. It wasn't a globally huge difference. Let's put it that way. Okay. I think we have uh, time for one more question. So I, I appreciated that. I thought uh, you made a really good point about the energy inequality. So I want to ask about, um, do you know what initiatives may be out there to actively, that actively seek to increase the energy infrastructure for the poorest countries? For example, like if I go on a diet, that doesn't feed a, chi a child in China. So, so, you know, that energy inequality is a serious problem. How, which organizations are intentionally building energy infrastructure in poor countries so they can actually have energy? So part of the Paris Agreement was that every country was supposed to submit 
a nationally determined contribution. It's basically a voluntary. And they're available for public. So those 30, those, the low human development age countries have been submitting those. And all of them, well, the ones I've read, there are two are in French. My French is horrible. <laughs> but most of them actually are planning to build um, energy infrastructure. So I'll, I'll give you a, an example. And I'm, the, the country escapes me. But only 50% of the populace has access to electricity. And a lot of the cooking is done with biomass, which is probably mostly um, wood. So for health reasons, as well as development reasons, they're going to try to shift the cooking away from the biomass and will probably be on something like natural gas at first. They can't shift to electricity. They simply don't have the electrical infrastructure to do it yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, 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 they're taking it, from what I can read in the NDCs, they're taking it very seriously. Um, but they're handicapped. You know, they're starting from a position that's very low. I'd also be remiss that if I said that in this picture, there's another group that's being missed. And the, the injustices there are perhaps even higher. And that's the indigenous peoples in these various, in these various countries. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you so much uh, to our speakers today. Great job.